Hello guys and welcome back to Relevant Founders, brought to you by Relevant Software. Relevant is an international software development company that designs, builds and delivers world-class standard products for Fortune 500 companies and promising startups. Today on the show, we have Brian Spector, CTO and co-founder of Credo. Brian has been involved in what he calls a little dark art of mathematics, also known as cryptography, since his high school days. This led him to establish Credo, a cybersecurity company that provides a platform for decentralized custody of digital assets. In this episode, we'll be talking about the creation of Credo, the minds behind the machine, the superpower of seeing around corners, why you need to have that certain type of aggressiveness to succeed in crypto, and Credo's mission to become an agent of disruption to the financial market as we know it. All this and more on Relevant Founders. Enjoy. I'm doing well. How are you? Good, very good. Thank you. Sun is shining. All is good. Brian, let's get straight to it. So what I want to do, let's start off with just finding a little bit more about you, find a little bit more about your history and what brought you to where you are now at Credo. Okay. Um, I'll try and keep, I'll try and give you the short version of the story. Um, so I, I've been involved in uh, a little dark art of mathematics called cryptography since, um, you know, I, I guess I was in high school. Uh, I had a really, um, a really inspiring professor slash teacher who kind of got me into it and um, sparked my imagination. Um, and at that time, there was obviously no uh, cryptocurrency uh, around, but um, it was really kind of relegated to, you know, sort of math geeks and folks that would go work in intelligence agencies and the Alan Turing types. Um, went to uni after uni, went to grad school, kind of aborted that, moved down to D.C., didn't like it there. Moved to Silicon Valley um, when I was still living in the States, um, ended up working at a little um, data security company, encryption company called RSA Data Security. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, I joined as a junior developer and I was probably like employee number 50. Okay. Um, at this time, uh, we were just getting going and this was basically kind of um, an upstart startup that was trying to propagate this new fangled encryption protocol that um, was really kind of like a quantum leap forward and what you could do with crypto. Um, for the first time, I could actually grab a key of yours, send you uh, some information encrypted with that key, and you'd have to decrypt it with another key. Basically, that's public private key cryptography. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, uh, it kind of made its way into things like web servers. So online shopping was born. Um, made its way into communications devices so we could all talk encrypted end to end uh, and um, kind of change the world. So, you know, I was there sort of riding this first wave of enterprise crypto, um, got very lucky in that I, I wasn't a great developer uh, and my boss took pity on me and basically said, hey, why don't you get into product management? So I did that, um, went to work for a little company uh, in Cambridge, England called Encipher. Um, that just got acquired by and trust. And so we made uh, hardware security modules for like governments and banks where you'd kind of keep your crypto keys in. So they sort of like the advanced version of a ledger, but like um, for the enterprise market. So I'd always been like really, really interested in cryptography. And then all of a sudden, you know, around 2009, 2010, um, I started reading up on Bitcoin a lot. And by this time I was already CEO of my own startup which um, was nice, but it was not like setting the world on fire. And, um, you know, to be frank, it was like boring as all hell, man. We were like selling these SDKs to chip manufacturers. So their AES crypto algorithms would go faster in silicon. And mm -hmm. Bitcoin, meanwhile, is taking off and everybody's piling into it. And all of my peers back home are, you know, getting so excited about it. And I kind of looked across the table for my chief cryptographer and I was like, I feel like I'm wasting my life, man. I really want to get into blockchain. Like, how do I get out of here? Mm -hmm. um, so we all exited out of that business in 2016. And uh, I thought, well, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain are so new. There's bound to be some billion dollar problems that I can solve. Um, and I just sort of got to work on looking at things from like an enterprise security perspective, um, kind of with the thesis that one day Bitcoin and the rest of the cryptocurrencies that are of value and utility will actually be accepted by the mainstream traditional finance firms. And in order for that to happen, that's a long way between A and B. Um, 
the products have to mature in such a way that, you know, you can make Bitcoin fit inside of JP Morgan rather than, you know, making JP Morgan fit for Bitcoin. And I know a lot of crypto purists out there are going to go like, oh, boo. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, I am a crypto anarchist at heart. Um, I like to say I'm a coin operated crypto anarchist at heart. Mm -hmm. So um, while I was trying to exit out of my uh, company that I was talking about that made these SDKs, um, I met my, my partner, uh, Anthony Foy, who's the CEO of Credo, um, because he tried to buy my company, which was called Miracle. Um, Miracle is an acronym for Multi-Precision Integer Rational Cryptographic Library, by the way. Okay. You need to say that fast five times while shooting tequila. That was a, a hiring test. Um, and uh, uh, I blew up that sale. Um, nevertheless, uh, Anthony and I remained friends and actually became you know, really, really good friends. And then um, when I started credo and started getting that going um he was like hey what are you doing with this blockchain stuff and i was like oh you know you've got this going on and you know we're kind of just i'm self-funding it and getting it going and uh then he managed to sell his startup which is a, a fairly large large SaaS company in the uk um and he became available i was being the ceo and cto at this point and i and then i relentlessly stalked him for about a year until he uh finally got so worn down that he joined a ceo so that's how we got here. It's one of those things. It's, I mean, it was really well. It was really new when you started it. Yeah, when you when you got let's say happily obsessed with the idea of what's going to happen. Um, it's one of those things. It must be so difficult to know where to start. Where do you start from? Because there's just so much to do. How did you decide where to start from? Yeah, I mean, just. I don't know. I don't, you know, uh, I have kind of two superpowers, I guess. One is, is that I'm lucky enough to get uh, people a lot smarter than me to, to work alongside me. Um, so that's helpful. Um, the other is occasionally I can see around corners or just a bit over the horizon, um, which you kind of learn during, you know, if you cut your teeth in product management in Silicon Valley, you're kind of classically trained. This is what, you know, they expect of you to sort of have a little bit of mind reading forecasting on, on, you know, the way the markets are going to turn or which technologies are going to come out and influence it, or if the market is going to expand, which customer segments are going to dictate their overall requirements on it. Mm -hmm. So I actually kind of had this, the concept for Credo, like in my back pocket for a while. And it, it was really simple. It was just basically like, okay, Right now, every institutional investor that's dipping their toe in the water, whether it be a hedge fund or, you know, um, and this, keep in mind, this is four or five years ago, um, whether it be a hedge fund on Wall Street or, you know, Chain Street or, you know, even Fidelity was kind of making little nascent Bitcoin purchases. Um, once they purchased their Bitcoin, they'd end up sending their Bitcoin off to a crypto custodian. Mm -hmm. Now, the, you probably heard in crypto, not your keys, not your money, right? Um, so it just seemed to me like that was really antithetical to the whole decentralized monetary movement. I mean, here we are, I'm buying a decentralized currency that isn't controlled by any one government, yet I'm handing it off to a third party who's got absolute control and is centralized, mm -hmm. you know? So like that just, that's just dumb. Um, what this industry needs is a decentralized custodian. So if you think about it, it's a vault that um, it runs on a decentralized network that is purpose built to capture all of the requirements that, you know, the big financial institutions are used to having from their custodian uh, operations, you know, when they deal in stocks and bonds and whatever. But this is going to work for them in crypto, but it's going to be decentralized. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing is, is that we we realized as we started specking this out, that's like, oh my gosh, we pick up so many more security benefits and, you know, it's trustless and, you know, everything else. If we go this route, um, it was a much harder challenge technically because a lot of crypto custodians operating that time are like, yeah, yeah, sure. Send me your Bitcoin at this address. And they'd have like a ledger, you know, and that was their business. They'd like, you know, have one ledger for like one customer, um, a couple cold storage custodians would be like really off the wall and print out the private key or the seed value, stick it in a fire pouch envelope, take it inside of a mountain under the Swiss Alps and then lock it up. You know, and it's like, that's cold storage. And yeah, that was the other thing that struck me is just sort of like, okay, that's really ridiculous because what if 
I have some economic opportunities. I want you know to trade with my Bitcoin out of custody. It's an electronic network. I ought to be able to do that you know, with minimal delay. But these custodians were saying, well, it's going to take us three or four weeks to get the uh, you know, fireproof pow- pouch out of the Swiss Alps. So you know, it was, it, it was a market that I felt like was just ripe for disruption. You know? I really like this concept of explain it to me like I'm five. Explain it to me like I'm five. What is it you do at Credo and what is your mission? So um, my personal mission is that I want to um, be an agent of destruction for the current financial system as, uh, as it stands today. Um, I'm sure our, our blue chip customers are going to love me saying that. And I'm sure my sales team is just going to give me hell once they hear me saying that. But um, from a mission standpoint, a personal mission standpoint, you know, if you study um, history, if you study mercantilist banking all the way through to the history of the United States, the way that capitalism has been structured, particularly around central banking, is that the people close to the nexus of that money issuing of that fractional reserve banking system are the ones that really can take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, you know, any other sort of industry, those who crave power generally aren't, you know, the uh, the most moral folks amongst us. Right. Um, the net of that whole situation is that, you know, the human race has had a pretty bloody go for the last 200, 300 years, right? And all of that, you know, the global endemic poverty, food shortages, everything really can be kind of traced back to our reliance on fractional reserve banking. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what really got me about Bitcoin when I read the Satoshi paper. I was like, oh my God, this this has a chance to really usher in a uh, a new monetary system globally for the human race that will really up level our capability to live in peace and harmony and not fuck up our environment. And sorry, um, and you know, generally make a, a better world for you know our children. So that's that was like why I got into blockchain. I just thought, okay, this is cool, but. Um, you know, when you're out raising money with VCs and stuff, that's not exactly the uh, cogent business plan that they want to hear. So um, what Credo does is if you think about how cryptocurrencies work and the main attraction of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, it's that no one actually controls Bitcoin, right? It's permissionless and it's censorship resistant. As long as, I mean, I could literally, you know, print out a 32 character alphanumeric number and if I could commit it to memory, there's no way I could. Um, but if I could, you know, I could use that to generate a wallet address, send billions into it and walk around the globe with nothing more than this number in my head. Mm-hmm. And nobody can take that money away from me. It can't be seized by a government. It can't be taxed. The inflation mechanism within Bitcoin is set so that, you know, it is um, it can't be devalued by any one government. And, you know, the most important thing is it's fair, it's transparent and it's fair, or it's the closest approximation of a monetary system we have that is fair. Um, What I realized like, you know, five years ago, and I was probably too early, a little bit too early, was like, okay, again, kind of going back to the point, we've got a decentralized monetary system where you have, you know, millions of nodes all over the globe running computing power and miners trying to solve these proof of work puzzles to secure this network through you know vast amounts of electricity nevertheless there's this global community working in unison to um keep up the bitcoin monetary network in such a way that it's functional and you know it it, uh, continues to grow in value and utility what what struck me about you know just not even bitcoin but the whole decentralized crypto space as a whole was that every um, decentralized uh, cryptocurrency ended up, you know, even their foundations ended up using some guy who had just started up a crypto custodian and their value pitch was, yeah, we're centralized, you know, yeah, we manage, you know, the private keys to the wallets that you send us your money to. And our value proposition is, well, we can manage the security of those private keys that control the funds in those wallets better than you can. Mm -hmm. And that's just like, okay, that is, that's just, that's boneheaded crazy, right? Um, a little bit of background about me, like having worked in crypto, you know, crypto is really hard. Like, you know, if you screw up managing a private key or it leaks or you handle it the wrong way that may be, you know, uh, exploited by an attacker to rebuild the key or, or, you know, reconstitute a signature, hey, that's it, you lost your money, right? But 
the best way you could actually protect a wallet that um, has a ton of money in it is by decentralizing the control of the signature process of that wallet. And the reason why that became possible was kind of like a lucky strike. Right when I started getting really into, you know, Bitcoin, a field, another field of mathematics in crypto, the dark art, started really kind of gaining traction in that the field of research went from being purely academic into what we call practical, right? So it's like, okay, yeah, I can read all the, you know, big math numbers on the page, but God forbid I tried to code this up in Python because thing would be slow as dog me, right? Nobody would ever run a production. But the work that started happening in this field, it started getting like, hey, you know what? A one, two second delay, I, I can live with that. And the field is called multi-party computation. And if you know anything about crypto um, and the way, you know, I tried to explain this to people like five years ago and their heads would explode. And it's okay if your head explodes and I, because it sounds like I'm talking nonsense and sorcery, but this really is, um, this really is probably the biggest advancement in cryptography bar none, since the invention of public-private key cryptography in the late 70s um, by Rivest, Shamir, and Alderman, the guys behind RSA. Footnote, I know Clifford Cox invented RSA, the RSA algorithm at GCHQ in 1971, but the Brits wouldn't let him, you know, declassify it. That's why he's walking around like a very bitter guy, you know, like, anyway, I go, I, I digress. Cl Clifford isn't bitter. He's, he's taking it, well, um, I'd be bitter. So anyway, um, you know, that, that leap forward in cryptographic capability enabled online shopping, right? It, it, it's, it, it's fair to say that it transformed our society. Math, that mathematical innovation enabled the Amazons, the Ebays of the world, you know, our, our adoption of the internet in a way that is relatively secure so that we can have private conversations over it. And it's, it's kind of mind boggling. We just hit another payload. And I'm going to describe to you what it is, you know, and hopefully it, it, like, like, it, like you're five and I'm five or maybe six. And I just discovered this great new toy. So the problem with like cryptocurrency and, you know, cryptocurrency wallets is that it uses public private key cryptography, which means I've got a private key. Now, if I lose that private key, I lost my money. Right. And that and that's kind of a scary thing for people. It's like there is no like, um, you know, help desk you can call and go, oh, hey, uh, somebody stole my private key from a Bitcoin wallet. You know, that it's just people will laugh at you. Right. So there's a level of kind of responsibility. And, uh, you know, dare say, I think people find that intimidating, which is a reason why a lot of people haven't gotten into crypto. But it's also a reason why companies like Ledger make these devices where you can carry around your crypto keys and, and whatnot. The problem is, is that if you try and, and run um, custodian operations where you've got multiple people who need, um, you know, different levels of approval over the release of funds or trading activity or what have you not, they can't all be walking around with ledgers trying to plug them in. It, it, it just, it's never going to scale, right? Mm -hmm. So what multi-party computation does is it allows a decentralized network of computers who, you know, can be across the globe to start throwing big prime numbers at each other in this kind of network protocol. And at the end of the run of the protocol, they'll have produced a digital signature over something that they've been given to sign all jointly. And as an example, they've been given that something signed is a Bitcoin transaction. So here we are, we've got like three or four guys, you're in New York, I'm in London, there's another guy in Santiago, there's another guy in Guam, I don't know why Guam, that just, weird but anyway so we all start running this protocol on our laptops talking to each other over the internet and you know it's secure nobody can eavesdrop nobody can try and futz with it even though we don't have a private key to make a bitcoin signature at the end of that protocol we generated a digital signature that to the bitcoin network looks smells touches feels exactly like an edsa signature that had been made from my mom and, you know, Sonora, Arizona, Alpha Ledger device, mm -hmm. because it is mathematically the same. It is in effect a way to replace the need to carry a private key with a network protocol. Now, from a security standpoint, if I'm a hacker, you know, and I know you've got a billion in, you know, on your Ledger device, you know, there's a couple of different ways I can, you know, try and, and get at that um, at that key. The most popular form is what we call rubber hose cryptography, 
which is essentially I find out where you're at. I tie you down to your chair and I beat the shit out of you with a rubber hose until you give me your ledger device and the passcode, right? So that is a big concern that's happening all the time. But with multi-party computation, those identity, those identities and the people behind those machines can be hidden from which they run the protocol. And an attacker, an astute attacker, wouldn't just have to find you and get your ledger device and your private key. He'd have to find where all of those people running that protocol across the globe are, right? So now the attack surface for trying to steal your money out of an, a multi-party computation created wallet goes exponentially higher in terms of the effort required. You know, it's, it's uh, nothing's impossible in crypto, but um, done right, it's, it's pretty much impossible. And that is a new, that we don't even know how this is going to affect commerce and everything else yet. But from a cryptocurrency perspective, it is incredibly revolutionary. Tell me, let's go back slightly to the MVP. So you launched, I, launched, uh, I believe it was April 2019, you launched your first MVP, if I'm correct. Um, yes. Tell me about this MVP. How did you approach it? What did it look like at the beginning? Um, it was actually not half bad. Uh, and, uh, you know, I usually am, am the kind of guy that goes for like a command line demo or, you know, it doesn't have to be have this slip UI. Anthony, um, you know, fought me tooth and nail on that one. And he was right, um, in part because the audience that we were targeting was at both a potential user and a potential investor. Um, you know, the, the, the metaverse and, you know, the crypto space is rife with folks or, you know, have made millions just by holding on to Bitcoin and then like, oh, well, I'll put a half million into your project. Right. So it was, it, it was kind of that capability for us to go get feedback to further the product from a functional standpoint, but also, you know, potentially pick up a couple, a couple of customers as well too, which we actually did, um, we did some very novel things where we utilized, uh, you know, the mobile phone as a signing application for um, the digital signatures that go on our asset tracking blockchain. So we run, I mean, uh, we're an L2, uh, you know, effectively we're our own blockchain that's dedicated and purpose built as a custodian blockchain. Um, and once people kind of grok that and could see it like, oh, I can move money from, you know, my Binance account back to custody and then over to Wabi and, you know, back again and go to a DeFi protocol or snap on a wallet. Um, they got, it was easier for them to get the central premise of what our differentiation was, which is that like, you know, not your keys, not your money, dude. If you're sending your keys to, you know, you're sending your money to, you know, I hate, I hate calling competitors out, but let's say Bitco, um, you know they've got your money and you might be involved in a joint signature process, but at the end of the day, you know, if the feds don't like you, they can take your money and freeze it. Right. Um, it's just, it just was to me, looked like a very, very brittle architecture, but what we quickly realized with what we were talking about, once we got people over the hump of like, wait a minute, the vault itself is decentralized. Like um, people understood why that was a better mousetrap. Right. Because there was there it, there are no keys to seize and you're actually taking the best bits of decentralization and consensus mechanisms and game theory to create a vault that is decentralized. Um, and by being decentralized, you know, your money is not attackable in one central place. You know, so, um, yeah, but, yeah, that was that was kind of the spirit of why we did it. It it wasn't much. It was like a, you know, a cheap iPhone over test flight and like a web page and, you know, but it was enough. Did you, when you did it then, did you focus on this in-house or did you outsource your engineers? To no, we, we, uh, we hacked away on it in-house. Um, oh, well, that's not true. Um, we did get the final UI bits uh, outsourced because, um, you know, cryptographers not, should not do user interface design and user interface people should not do cryptography. This is what we, uh -huh. what we learned. Um, yeah, aesthetic and taste. And, you know, I know good art when I see it, but I, I, I finger paint like a five-year-old. So it was, it was uh, yeah, we did the finishing bits like later on down the road. Um, we did manage to also build our own security appliances and deploy them globally as well too, because at the time we weren't really satisfied with the security efficacy of, you know, the, 
the secure enclaves that were being offered out on the market. But we, um, yeah, we, AMD has come up a long way. So we're, we're standardizing on that. But we, yeah, we basically built everything sort of from scratch and, you know, duct tape and barbed wire and, you know, nice. held it together long enough to, to start scaling up. So tell me, for example, um, let's go back to 250. Yeah, it's a lot, a big, uh, a huge amount of staff now. With the challenges with your which what you're facing and what you're trying to do at Credo, are you now outsourcing a lot of the work? Are you trying to outsource a lot of the work to stay up to date? You're saying about the challenges of the market. It's a war out there. How are you challenging that? Um, a couple of different ways. Well, you know, engineers are are. Um, we're strange beasts and that we are, you know, everybody likes to get paid a lot of money. Everybody likes a lot of stock options, but you know, generally the good engineers will also like to as well work on hard and interesting problems. Right. You know, I I mean, anybody can go get a job over at Barclays and work on their Java backend, you know, doing payroll accounting, but it's like, Oh my God, you know, like Mm -hmm. that's a waste of space. outlook as you yeah so you were saying that you were doing this um thing before you went to credo but you knew it was not exciting you engineers have this this need to to do something which excites them it's not just money yeah i think every engineer wants to see you know their their labor of love and their hard work ultimately get out in the market and you know be loved by people it's it's no different than like you know a band writing an album and then like you know having it released and you know it's a hit record it's like hell yeah you know um it's it's a lot like that actually so you know you have to interest people i think in in this new day and age of you know you sign them up to a tour of duty Mm -hmm. yeah i I like to break work elements down into like you know a year two years three years and say okay look man you're coming into the organization you're going to be doing this for two years Mm -hmm. so it's like signing up to the u.s army right you'll rotate out and whether you want to stay after those two years bro like if you like it and, you know, and the opportunities there, I will further, you know, do everything I can to further your career. But I think that's a much more honest conversation and a more authentic conversation to have with people rather than doing all sorts of like raw, raw bullshit. You know, it's like you can break it down to an individual scope. So with this at the moment, then, where, where are you hiring from? Where are most of your hires from now? And where have been the most, you know, those star places which you found thought, these engineers are good? They're, they're, uh, well, um, in my last company and when we started getting going, I, I've always, you know, set up development offices in Sofia, Bulgaria, because uh-huh. uh, it is, you know, it's great people, highly well-educated, super hardworking, um, and you know brilliant technologists and one of my best friends is our vp of engineering we met at my last company and you know i kind of went straight to i went back to muhammad on the mountain and was like hey man let's let's set up set up another office out here and he's like okay let's do it um is he you know so is he from bulgaria uh-huh. is he himself from bulgaria oh yeah 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 um after covid though you know things just it just, again, it just didn't make sense to like, oh, we can only hire in Sofia, we can only hire in Dublin or only hire in London. I mean, it's more sort of global time span now mm-hmm. um, that, you know, if you were on the West Coast, it's probably like a little bit too far. You're in Hawaii, it's definitely too far. Um, but, you know, Singapore probably going East, you know, and Puerto Rico if you're going West. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're a great talent, um, not just in engineering, but in marketing or sales or, you know, design, um you know we've got so many open headcount it's ridiculous so you know we want to talk to you i can imagine so i'm i'm based here we're based in ukraine we're in the west uh, western part of ukraine very safe com- well in comparison to what's happening here in many parts um but it is that um eastern european mindset which is so good and have, have, has actually made the engineers so amazing. I, I love yeah i love ukraine I, I i've spent a lot of time in kiev and they've been you know wonderful people wonderful country you know, horrible situation. Um, we've looked for Ukrainian engineers, um, you know, just as a matter of course, feel like we could do a tiny little thing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, the war hasn't uh, stopped them from being highly in demand anyway. So it's like, well, well, you know, we'll we'll pay for your reload. We'll send you anywhere. You know, 30 or 40 percent of them don't want to move, um, which is admirable and brave. Uh, and, you know, the others are, you know, well, you know, I'm, I'm getting moved out to Dubai or Sydney or something. I was like, wow, OK, so, you know. But hats off, I, I think everybody's trying to make the best of a bad situation. It goes back to what we were saying about the saturated market. Yeah, you, engineers are in so high in need that regardless of what's happening in Ukraine, people still need Ukrainians. Ukrainians have showed they're still ready to work. Um, and it's, as I said, it's that mindset. Is that mindset what they've got in Bulgaria as well? I've never um, spoken with Bulgarian engineers. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, you know, you, I mean, it's a... I would say the folks that have been uh, had experience working for Western companies are, you know, have a leg up mm-hmm. um, and there's a huge talent pool that, that has. And I think that sort of, you know, Eastern European mindset is, um, which has probably been developed by necessity and scarcity over, you know, decades. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whereas, you know, Americans, we, we, uh, we work hard, because we're inspired, um, you know, it, uh, there's a lot of us that are lazy, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm not inspired and, you know, I'll show up nine to five or whatever. And it's like, you know, we don't want those people, but, um, uh, you know, I, I find that you, the Ukrainians and Americans have a lot and that they're a lot in common. There's a kind of a common, let's roll up your sleeves sort of demeanor and just get it done. Absolutely. I mean, the guys here always have been shot how, if they have to work 12 hour days, they don't moan. I mean, I'm from London myself. And if you told a Londoner to work 12 hour days, they would tell you <laughs> that they're not happy. But here it's not even a moan, um, no moan ever. Even during the war, first two days was like, okay, let's get used to what's happening and then back to work. And it was just so surprising to see. Let's uh, talk uh, a little bit. I know we haven't got much time, so let's talk a little bit about the challenges that you've got at Credo. Um, what have been the biggest challenges as to late, which you've um, been trying to tackle? Uh, you know, it's our growth. Um, it's the sort of relentless pressure to, you know, in my case, get uh, our protocol upgrade out. Um, you know, our, our version one protocol was, you know, done like most startups are, you know, you sort of drive off a cliff in a half built airplane and, you know, you're trying to assemble the wings before you crash. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of stuff, and that builds up a lot of technical debt. And with cryptocurrency, it's interesting because you build up protocol debt as well too, where you're like, okay, we, we took this thing as far as we can. We got to backpedal a little bit and Mm -hmm. take another way out. Um, you know, I've always been into information theory and game theory and and uh, bilineal pairing cryptography. I guess the other challenge is, is that, you know, this, this stuff is hard, man. It, it's hard to design a really good protocol that has all the right game theory and economic incentives. And, and particularly if you're trying to do something um, incredibly bold and disruptive, it's, you know, it, it's as challenging a, a technical um requirement as I've ever sort of faced. But, you know, I'm also, thank my lucky stars, I get to work on, you know, such cool stuff. Talk to me about, you're talking there about the growth. Yeah, that's a challenge as well. I mean, it's obviously one of the challenges that you want, the growth, but how are you tackling that growth? If it's growing so fast, how are you able to do what you want and it not kind of go out of hand? Yeah, we, we've we reorganized into this, um, squads and tribes concept um which is closely aligned to sort of the the okrs that we have around sales and product release and and other um you know objectives that we have at a corporate level and the reason um we're giving this a shot is because you tend to find you know there are different um initiatives going now on within the company that are just as new as the people that are coming in but what we found is that once we highlight those initiatives up to folks, to everybody in the company, that's part of what we'll be doing in our company kickoff. Um, those initiatives, if they're of value, if they're sufficiently challenging, if they you know, speak to someone's soul, the, the right per- people for that initiative will find you. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that doesn't mean we're just you know, off doing willy-nilly projects, but what we want to be able to do is give people enough latitude so that they 
you know, there might be some, you know, brain dead work that they've got to work on, but, you know, they're also inspired because, you know, they've gotten their feet wet and, and stuck in on initiatives or projects that um, they're passionate about, but will also make a dent in the universe in terms of the company progression. You know, people want to be able to, at the end of the day, say, you know, hang their hat on something and go, fuck, I did that, you know? And um, that's the kind of place that we want to build. Interesting. Nice. Keeping on the idea of uh, challenges, I just want to ask two uh, questions here quickly on challenges. Um, obviously, you're based in the UK, uh, US. They're a little bit, let's say, behind um, the mark on the whole crypto front, a lot of regulation. Um, is regulation good or bad? It is neither good nor bad, actually. Um, I mean, this is what I was talking about earlier, right? I think that's probably because I'm older. Uh and I'm just a bit more salty or cynical, but um, there are a lot of, you know, young 20 year old kids running around who started up these projects who think, you know, Citibank is going to use this and they're going to adopt to my protocol. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's a very naive mindset that is in crypto in regards to the steps as an industry that we have to take in order for decentralized finance to have a shot at reforming the centralized traditional finance um, business models that have led to, you know, not such a great situation for the human race, right? All of that requires trade-offs um, and compromise. Uh, so to the extent that regulation, people fear regulation is going to harm um, you know, crypto or and everybody's going to try and outlaw it, outlaw, you know, that's, that's just kind of hysterics and astronics. That's just not going to happen. The vision that I have, and I think a lot of people are starting to kind of wake up to is that what you want to do from a protocol perspective or a blockchain perspective is that you want to make your, your chain and, and your platform as censorship resistant as Bitcoin, right? I, you know, I, I don't, we're not going to operate from the stance of this is a permission chain or anything like that. Cause that would just sort of, that would sit well with me, mm -hmm. but from the standpoint of, okay, well, it's a permissionless chain, but somebody at the other end, the counterparty that you're working with, if they have to ID you or KYC or AML you before they can engage in a transaction with you, that doesn't mean your chain is, you know, now a permission chain. It means that you have an upstep in capability so that, Folks that need to AML and KYC people on the other end, they can. If they don't, they won't ask you for it. So the question from a technological perspective then becomes, well, how do you pull that off? How do you make a protocol that can support all of these, you know, in some cases, draconian regulations? Because I do think there's, there's probably a bit of like, you know, oh, we're going to squeeze the blockchain guys. How dare they try and take our franchise? Um, how do you deal with and comply with those rules yet at the same time not lose the ethos of why you got into this space in the first place and definitely not make your chain censorship resistant and permission and all that poor shit that you know people have died on on a thousand hills trying to do that's just not going to work so the you know uh, that is the cool challenging hard problem that we're you know one of them that we're at work at right now Give me, I, I know time is really, really running out. So I'm going to ask you one question where, a quick, two questions in one uh, quickly here. So uh, looking towards the future, we're saying this here, looking towards the future, I want to know where is the future for crypto? Obviously, we're talking about this journey has really only just started and you're there. You, so you see behind around the corners, you see um, what perhaps is going to happen due to your training. Where is the future? And also, where is the future for Credo? Oh, um... A big one. <laughs> So the future for Credo, okay, so for Credo, I would like to create a decentralized custodian that enables, um, and I think this is a, a, you know, a reasonable scope with still loads of ambition. I believe there's a huge hole in the market for, economic, for folks to securely store their crypto in a way that is um, germane with rules and regulations about, you know, crypto storage and custody, mm -hmm. 
but that gives them a flexibility and an ease of use that is way beyond sort of like, you know, I got to use this freaking ledger thing and their crappy software and blah, blah, blah. You know, nobody wants to do that. Um, at the same time, you know, seeing around the corner, you got to kind of take a look at the established markets today and you go, okay, like, you know, stock trading has been around like 400, 500 years and where has it evolved to, right? Well, if I've got a thousand shares of General Electric, I don't go and package up my share cert, send it over the wire to the New York Stock Exchange, where I have an account at the New York Stock Exchange, and they sell my GE, you know, shares for me, and then you know get back to me. I mean, by law, they can't do that, right? They can only work with licensed stockbrokers, and they don't want to do that. They're never going to talk to an individual, right? But that's what a licensed stockbroker like Charles Schwab does. They have a relationship with the New York Stock Exchange. They handle your deposit, your credit, you know, your paperwork, the KYC and AMLU. And for getting all that stuff done, then they can facilitate your actions on that big mega exchange. Crypto is going to be going that way. Interesting. It's just a matter of time. And that really then leads to some interesting things. Huh? How much time is that there? Five years. Okay. Wow. Not too long. Not too long. But because of the technical capability that is inherent within crypto platforms today, you're going to be able to sort of take that 400 year old paradigm and then turn it on its head and do some really, really cool stuff that will facilitate cross border payments and, you know, all sorts of other really, really interesting financial opportunities for folks that are equitable and fair and um, democratized so that people, even if you're in the Democratic or, you know, Republic of Congo and you've got five cents to your name, can still take advantage of that same economic opportunity. And to me, that's important. Um, you know, El Salvador standardized on the uh, on Bitcoin. They're making that move. I, I predict a lot of Latin American countries will ditch the dollar um because of the us's torturous past with the rest of latin america often bloody often exploitative um you know so they don't trust the dollar uh and you know i don't blame them um so i think there's you know it's going to be a very disruptive bumpy ride but um you know i like roller coasters too so there you go uh, hey guys it's me again if you enjoyed this episode of the show, be sure to press the thumbs up button below. And also, while you're there, hit subscribe. Otherwise, you could miss out on all of our interesting content we've got coming your way in the near future. Okay, guys, take care and see you soon.